Dubbing, dubbing, mixing, or re-recording is a post-production process used in filmmaking and video production in which additional supplementary recordings are lip-synced and mixed with original production sound to create the finished soundtrack. And the process usually takes place on a dub stage after sound editors uh, prepare all the necessary tracks, dialogue, automated dialogue replacement, ADR, effects, foley, music. The dubbing makes us proceed to balance the elements and record the finished soundtrack. And dubbing is sometimes confused with ADR, also known as additional dialogue replacement, automated dialogue recording and looping, in which the original actors re-record and synchronize audio segments. Outside the film industry, the term dubbing commonly refers to the replacement of the actor's voice with those of different uh, performing speaking, um, performer speaking another language, which is called revoicing in the film industry. The term dubbing is only used when talking about replacing a previous voice, usually in another language. When a voice is uh, created from scratch for animations, the term original voice is always used because in some cases this media is partially finished before the voice is implemented. The voice work would still be part of the creation process, thus being considered the official voice. So that's a lot of terms that is used in, in this field. And um, I know some of you use it and some of you don't, but that's a kind of official explanation of, 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 um, of this area here. One thing that's a really challenge is always the time. When we talk time, it the less time, well, that's better, less time spent, less money spent, and that's basic a headline in, in most cases. There's a limited uh, budget for, for, for time, and um, the less time we use, the better off we are, somebody think. Um, that is a rule that you have to get the most out of the uh, location shooting and the recordings you're doing there, because then you have less work in, in the dubbing uh, area after that. Uh, one example of that, uh, in 2014, I visited uh, TV Global in Brazil, and at that time they would produce three full one-hour soaps per day, and that would be either five or seven days a week that they would uh, deliver that for, for, for their viewers. And um, that was quite efficient, and any kind of dubbing work was almost only um, when we talk about dialogue, it was just replacing bad dialogue due to some noise or running out of batteries. Well, they never did, but they could have a wire that was making noise or something like that. Else it was 100% uh, dialogue recording on, on, on the set all the time, just to reduce time and they were very efficient. Um, in major film productions, at least, you may have a second unit uh, with you in the field. Second unit is a, a, f um, a unit of, uh, it could be a photographer, it could be the, the sound guy as well, uh, taking up additional material for the film where actors are not actually present, but you just have to film backgrounds and environments and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so that could be done. It is done actually, but that's of course expensive to have people traveling around the world just doing that. But still it provides original content and everybody make, making a film really wants to make original content as far as possible um, in that case. When you bring it home, you come to the ingest. How do we transfer from all the media? That's another topic. Uh, what is the format for that? Uh, how do we input it? How do we organize it? How do we access it afterwards? And how do we manage metadata with all this uh, information that we have been recording? And organizing the material, well, we have all the formats to think about. We have the storage. Do we have a storage for it? How do we access it from that st uh, storage, the accessibility? And again, the metadata. And what now if we have anything left on a perf recording? Uh, I guess we almost don't. I think everything has been 
re-recorded or transferred to digital media nowadays. But still, you may uh, take up old film uh, and uh, you may to um, remix something and some uh, media is actually present on, on magnetic tape here. When you want to work with it, then you have to design for your hardware, your software. Um, there are different religions, you could say, and uh, somebody will rely truly on, on Pro Tools, some will use other when we talk about the audio um, software. When we come to the hardware, there will be also different solutions. Uh, and um, it's, I would really like to hear what your opinion is on, on that, because uh, working with that on, on television compared to working with that on film, uh, there are different opinions of what is the optimum for, for that purpose. Um, sometimes your tracks need some cleaning. Uh, in the old days, you almost would be scraping in your perforated tape or something like that with a little knife to make fades or m remove bumps or whatever you had a pro problem. Uh, nowadays, you would use software just from CD audio or isotope or uh, anything like that. And uh, that could be um, very practical. But CETA, uh, both CETA and Isotope has really a, a large influence on what is going on. And especially the late, uh, last year's Isotope has really come in from uh, the right side and just pushing a lot of us uh, away from it. When we have been doing recording voices, we have the problem with speech intelligibility. Um, say again, please. That's not possible when we display a film. Uh, and um, basically, that's a problem. The, our dialogue should be understood the first time uh, it is presented. And uh, these days, we are moving away from making boom recordings, in some cases at least. Uh, we need action, we need different shots, and a uh, booming person is in the way for a, the good image. And we put microphones in weird places, and then we have to compensate for that in one way or another. And one thing we have to consider also is that, uh, for instance, research from DR and other places, is that uh, about half of the uh, viewers or listeners have a reduced uh, hearing ability. Um, so that means what, depending on what we are presenting, is it for television or is it for film, we have to think of um, what kind of an audience we have. Do Are they able uh, to listen or understand what the dialogue actually is? Or are they on their own on that? This is not our res responsibility in, in that case. That could also be a good discussion. We have the sound source, that is language is one thing, we may change that. We have the articulation. Nowadays, modern actors, they are very natural, so it's not the articulation as you would find at the theater. Uh, so they are talking very unarticulated, which provides us with problems. Speech rate, you may have a high speed rate, speech rate, and the speech level can be very low, almost whispering. And all that is difficult to pick up in the right way. And then um, maybe we can pick it up, but to present it to with enhanced speech intelligibility is one of the challenges we have. We have the voice directivity. Where do we pick up the voice? And what is the spectrum of, of the voice in, in that direction? We pick it up. That's a problem to have uh, to get the, the, it sound right. And uh, yeah, we have had some masks as well. Hopefully not on film. But in some uh, TV features, the masks have been on, actually. And when we talk about voice replacement or language replacement, there are uh, new opportunities. Uh, actually, by the aid of artificial intelligence, we now can just write a text and we can pick an actor to, to read it loud from that text automatically. Uh, so computer voices will be very common in the future. And um, actually, some of them are very good, uh, for at least for, for shorter presentations, and uh, that's very cheap. 
and uh, that's uh, really a problem for for, um, for for the product as such that it's so easy to do it in in, in that way. And we also have the voice clone uh, software. So if the actor has is gone and we need some a few words re repeated, uh, we can work with that and to to clone from existing um, recordings and, and then clone the voice in one way or another. Sometimes when we didn't have the second unit, we have the third unit, which is the archive of um, the, the sound effects that we may use. The sound libraries are very practical. Um, the thing is, however, things may go wrong. For instance, uh, I did an error once. I took picked a F1 car to present uh, in, a, in a session, and that was the car from the year before, and everybody could hear that uh, Mercedes was another car. Uh, it was too old, so I was wrong. And uh, well, at that time, I couldn't hear the difference. I can now. Uh, the wrong bird. Sometimes you present a bird in a wood, and uh, the bird doesn't live in that part of the world, and somebody will absolutely tell you when that happens. Or that bell of that church belongs to do not belong to any churches nearby this location or something like that. That's the thing you may go wrong with when you use uh, libraries if you're not uh, quite precise about what, what you're doing. Then we have the music recording, finding music, adaption of music. Uh, we may go to Prague and record a symphony orchestra, for instance, for our film drama um, production. Uh, or we may be that lucky that the guy that's doing the dubbing actually owns a, uh, a, a synthesizer, so he's able to do the recording for, for this feature program we're doing. Um, that could be the case. Or we have to go to archives or other kind of delivery services to find our music and pick that and uh, treat that for, for the purpose we're going to, to use it for. But that's also a, a huge thing in which end we are, are working with, with this kind of thing. Synchronization, in the old days, that would be a problem. We would have our clap tree and our clapper. And uh, of course, we still have that because it's a good information it, uh, to have our, our, our image, what scene we are having stored here if we don't have the metadata that tells it. Uh, so even though it's an old-fashioned thing, it's still in use uh, because that's practical. And then you basically would be counting the sprocket holes and moving the things around by moving the uh, magnetic tape compared to the film, uh, to uh, the working copy. Uh, nowadays, you just click on synchronize, and uh, then it's all there and very precise, and that's fine. One kind of synchronization we don't uh, think about uh, in that way is the uh, room size. That's why we use a mixing cinema to get an appropriate um, distance to the loudspeakers because there's the delay from the speakers to the listening position. So you should be seated in an average distance to the loudspeakers uh, to compensate for that uh, the, the delay you have or latency you have from the sound leaves the loudspeaker until it reaches your ears. And the level, of course, um, wh why, how are we delivering uh, the thing? Uh, is it for broadcasting network, for film, anything else? We have uh, loudness standards, and uh, basically they should be used. They're not used to that extent that they should be, but uh, more and more it, it gets there, in, in broadcasting at least. Um, Every network will have their own rules, more or less, for the, the level setting. So we still have a problem with uh, changing level with our remote control. That's the most um, weird button we may have uh, in, in use. That's the, um, the uh, level, uh, uh, the sound level of, of, of your our television set. So the formats, well, what are we doing? We worked in channels. Now we work with stems and objects. And uh, we also have to consider how that is done. And uh, it's a major change in, in how we work with things. 
and we have to think of that the product we make with the many uh, loudspeakers available, loudspeaker channels available, uh, they may be reduced to just a few channels when it is um, folded down to something that is uh, for, for, for the home formats in one way or another. And how do we live with that? That's a good question. Then also, of course, the formats, linear formats, uh, perceptual reduction of, of, of uh, data. What are the working formats? What are the delivery formats? And what kind of housekeeping do we have between all these formats to make sure we deliver the right thing? And then the room we're doing it, it could be the dubbing studio, it could be a mixing cinema or the unused room in the basement. Um, it's a huge thing to get the right acoustics, um, says the man that works with acoustics. And uh, well, that's the thing. So. Thank you for that. Um, that should be a kind of um, bullet points that could be worth a discussion, more or less. So uh, hopefully the panel is uh, will be on top of that, and we could have also questions coming in from uh, the participants, of which I can see there are 27 at this point. So. Um, Please, somebody, somebody want to take I was, over here? <laughs> thank you very much for the presentation, Eddie. Uh, I would just like to say that Alan Holmberg has joined us also from his car. Hi, Alan. Thanks for being here. You're muted at the moment, uh, just so you know. But now I'm not muted anymore. Hello, Thanks. everybody. Hello. Being late. <laughs> But you know no how problem. it is to tell production, I have to leave. And then the director kept shooting. So that's how it is. It's one of the challenges. Yeah, it exactly. Is. It is. Um, but Alan is a tourmeister, also educated at the Danish Film School. And he's a sound recordist. So he's mainly working with uh, on-set production sound. Yes. Thanks very much for being here. Um, I have a little poll that we can just ask the audience, uh, because I couldn't quite see from the email addresses um who they are so here you have a simple just one question are you um who's out there are you a student are you working in post-production <coughs> or production sound or not working on sound and just interested excellent okay i'll just let people answer that just so we know who we're talking to um, can you see the poll no only i can see the poll i can see it <laughs> <laughs> all right I'm just gonna end it there okay so we have a mixture of students and people working in uh, production design and post-production. Thanks for answering. We have a question in the Q&A here from Adrian Lawrence. Um, a question on voice cloning. Which commercial software is out there and suitable for post-processing workflows? Uh... I think you you could Google that. You will find uh, two, at least two or three commercial products. Um, so it's it's. Uh, I mean, the the cloning thing is um, uh, that that the different approaches to to do that. All right. More more or less sophisticated. Okay, so it's not really a problem. Um, I know we have uh, Christian Scheuer out there from Soundflow. Um, he can perhaps uh, tell us a little bit about his product at his uh, his his company. Um, hi. <laughs> Just so you know, it's possible for us to unmute your microphone if anyone would like to speak directly to the panel. Um, yeah, Christian has a company called Soundflow, which uh, optimizes, I get this right, so macros in, uh, in, is it in, oh, 
with another question. Um, digital audio workstations, and uh, that could be interesting to speak about as well. Before we get into that, a question from Lars Rasmussen. Is there any clone software in Danish? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, Not yet. Is that something that we, should be developed? It will be. I, I mean, sooner or later, it, it is there. OK. So that's a no for now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And I'm just going to ask the, the panel directly. Alan, yeah. you're yeah. working mostly with onset uh, sound. Yep. What challenges do you have in your daily work that is related to handing over that content to the to the post production team? Uh, none. Okay. So we just <laughs> uh, <laughs> you do uh, your job. I do my job and then I'll give it to no what I, I, and then deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> are there certain challenges you face in your everyday work that cause uh, a stressful situation or problems with budget or technological limitations or uh, what is there anything in particular you're you're dealing with or I mean, maybe your work is just straightforward and. No, uh, no, no, of course not. I think <clears> that one of the challenges right now or, or the these years is that the, um, the world is more noisy than it used to be. So going on location has a lot of challenges because there's a lot of noise everywhere. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, it was very easy to find a spot where you could do dialogue outdoors. Now it's practically impossible. Uh, and a lot of equipment is very noisy. It also was that back in the days we had um we had uh, hmi lights going with their beep and so on but now everything is remote and with fans and i think it it's it's very nice to do sound until the rest of the departments arrive then then they fuck it all up for for the sound department um i think that the challenge is is a lot of this will fix it in posts is is getting under the skin of everybody. So nobody takes it serious that you have sound on set and oh, we can always fix or we can always do this and we can always do that. And yes, it's true. But but in my philosophy, you will get the best result the first time on set. So I will always strive to to get that. But I think these days people are taking it less seriously that you actually are doing sound on set and you're actually are trying to get the dialogue and the actors performance uh, back home yep so but most of the productions you're working on they give you the the time you need and the setup you need to no. be able to no, no. they don't no. they don't that's a problem <laughs> yeah, that, that that that's a problem, but that's how it is. Everybody is 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 short of money, so you'll have to. I think a lot of the times you 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 have to run faster, and you have to think about solutions. How to you have to be creative to get your sound right uh, the first time, <clears throat> because there's not a lot of uh, patience with the sound department. So you just have to either you you'll you'll get your sound, or you just fuck off the set because nobody have patience uh, and I'm, I'm not an angry old man saying this it's just how it is there's no patience with sound so you have to be creative in 200 different ways to to succeed in in, in getting your sound that comes with experience hopefully Yes, so you're generally able to deliver good quality <laughs> sound, <Yeah. laughs> even though you've got these restraints, constraints. Yep. Um, okay, great. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, then let's move over to the post-production side of things.
with uh, Martin. Can I ask you about some of the, the challenges you face in your daily work? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I also do uh, location sound from time to time, but it's uh, it's been a year or so since I did it last time. So now I'm pretty much in post mode. But I've done productions where I've been both the sound recordist and the sound designer afterwards. So it's uh, and on these, I mean, when I record myself, I may have the tendency to know what I can remove afterwards. Uh, and then it sometimes it turns out a bit worse than what other, what other people get to me. Uh, and also because I'm not I'm not working on set all the time. So the people who work like specialized totally on being on set all the time, they have like they are better at being on set than I am. But it's um, I know the challenges. You have to work fast. You have to be ready. You don't want people to wait for sound. You want to be smiling and happy, and uh, and sometimes you record in a nice location, and then we, if you record in a nice location, then you kind of typically get angry because you want everybody else to be quiet, and then you can because then you can actually control how quiet it is. If you work in a noisy location, for instance, uh, the metro or something like that, where you have to do dialogue, but you know that it will never be really good. You know that you will be have to, you have to do some ADR in the end. You have to do some uh, replace some dialogue because uh, you cannot. It's not possible to get the the close intimate dialogue that the director wants in this noisy setting. But but visually it looks so great, and uh, in the end when we're done with post and we've done all the. Uh, the uh, post synchronization and so on, it will also be great. But you know that it has to be um, has to be done a lot of uh, dialogue replacement afterwards. And then you have then you'll probably just be like, okay, that's okay, go with the flow, try to record a lot of extra ambient noises. I place a lot of small microphones around uh, all, uh, all all over the place to get like extra effects. But I'm not using that so much, I use a lot of archive material also. So, um, so what are my challenges? Time is always uh, of an issue. Uh, ambition, lots of ambition, little time, that uh, can be a problem. But uh, uh, I try to say yes as much as possible because then it kind of, then I keep my positive attitude and I make up new solutions as I go along and then uh, we can uh, uh, make it sound great. Uh, there's one one thing I have to say, like one of the most important times uh, in doing sound is like the first time I see a, a, a film or a episode of a television program. Uh, I work mostly in fiction but the first time I see it, I have to note which lines I don't understand because after I've seen it once, then I start to understand it. And then uh, then I forget to do a replacement of dialogue or I may not be uh, digging as much into the, the line to make it intelligible, but the it's an intelligibility is super important and you have to, have like super pointy ears the first time you uh, hear a show while working. Do you listen back on uh, studio monitors or do you also try listening back on a TV or laptop speakers or something? Yeah, I, lose, I listen a lot on studio monitors, but when we when I work with television uh, episodes, uh, fictional fictional format, I, I would do all of our um, final showings on like a sound bar on a television. Uh, uh, the sound bar is pretty okay, but they tend to have like crabby subwoofers that take over at an, at an annoying frequency. So you, uh, so which is, sounds really bad if you don't treat your dialogue uh, in a good way. So uh, then you're kind of safe. <laughs> it feels safe if you use like the sound uh, bar of sorts, some consumer stuff. And also I see it on my phone, I see it on my laptop, I see it like everywhere I can get to it. And at the moment I'm working on a Dolby Atmos project, which is mixed in a cinema and also mixed in my, in our own 
Atmos room with like good uh, studio monitors. But the with the good thing about Atmos is that you can actually make a file that's an MP4 file. I can just play it on my phone. It folds down to two tracks, and it's uh, and I can put it on the Apple TV, and it folds up to whatever is connected to the Apple TV. Uh, so uh, it's uh, it's easy to get to hear it on different speakers. But then again, it's Dolby. It's a it's uh, it's it's almost like cheating because it's so easy compared to doing stuff for uh, broadcasts because uh, when you're broadcasting and you have to be in the flow television thing and you have to deliver to Luft's uh, standards it's a different ball game because you have uh, you always have the news that are super loud dialogue but then you have complex material with music dialogue gunshots screaming whatever and all has to be within the same kind of Luft's measurement as something as uh, simple as uh, the news and that's it will always be news will always be louder and always be easier to understand compared to uh, complex material on um, when you're working with fiction but well what in some day it will all be uh streaming so uh, then it's easier to work with fiction i guess alan you have a comment no, it, it was not on this. It's on something else. We can go back to it later. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Morgan. Uh, we have some questions in the Q and A, so is it, I'll just take those now. Uh, from Daniel, how much do you push on set for the best result? I suppose that's to Morton and Alan. Either of you. I try to work as fast as possible and uh, to 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 make all the changes as quickly as possible. On uh, I mean, I have to place microphones on the actors, and uh, they I only have a, like like a limited amount of time to uh, and a limited amount of tries to put the mic in the right place. So it's practice, practice, and uh, working fast. But I think Alan probably is better at answering this because he's like more. Set yeah, what 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 was the question? Can I see it in the Q and A? Mm -hmm. It's from Daniel Lindvik. How much do you push on set for the best result? Will you stop the entire production to? <clears throat> no, and yes, it it depends. Uh, it depends on 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 what kind of film it is and how, what who the director is and how your work is with them. Uh, usually, usually we, we pick our fights and, and we have that in the back of our heads all the time. We have to know, is this a topic I want to talk about now or do I have to uh, wait for later for uh, another problem that's maybe bigger because it always seems like there's limited, um, what do you say? Uh, uh, there's, there's always a limit for how much you can push the sound or the how much space you want for sound or how much you want the dialogue. If, if you raise your hand five times, then everybody is getting bored with you and say, oh, fuck off. So you have to always have to pick your fights, unfortunately, instead of saying, well, this is unusual, so we have to do it again. If you do that three times in a row, then they will start uh, questioning your abilities. So you always pick your fights. I don't know if that answer the questions, but that's how it is. I suppose it's important for you to have an understanding of what they can achieve in post-production as well. Exactly. Uh, the, the, the major thing for me is, is not how good I am uh, doing recordings. It is how, how well I am informed about what they can do in post usually once or twice a year I go back to post and I say okay how much can you do in isotope now how much can you do here how much can you do there so I always always have a a feeling about okay this humming I know they can remove it so I don't have to make a scene about this I don't have to stress oh we have to shut this off they can fix it easily so 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 I, I really try to keep up to date with the abilities in in post-production but I I really hate whenever i talk to post-production and they, they said oh we had to adr this and we had to do this and blah 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 because i want to do it 
right the first time. So that's your goal. <laughs> Always. Yeah. Thanks a lot for that answer. Uh, from Lars Rasmussen, just a topic. You fix it on post and then you post and then in post you have one day to fix all issues. Yeah, that's the thing. But you can't possibly know exactly what their budget is or how much time they have. Can I can I say something? Yes. Yeah, it because it's related to this or for the problems we face when uh, recording it is. Uh, now nowadays you are a little bit left out of the pre-production both mostly in tv but also you are getting less and less involved when you are doing feature films uh, and the the pre your the sound department's pre-production days are cut and no, it's not always you are invited on the tech reggae so a lot of the problems you will encounter when you are on set it will be the first time you encounter them. And I think it, it's, it's, I don't know if, if, if people are being less aware of, or they don't know what sound is about, but I see a lot of the, the, I see a lot of, of pre-production being cut from everything. Nobody calls the sound guy and say, okay, we have to do this show. It's for uh, it's with four cars and it's a helicopter and blah, 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 blah. And then they talk about how much post-production do you need? No, it's like this. Uh, we have four weeks for the post-production. That's it. And it doesn't matter if it's a effects movie or if it's a TV series or whatever with a lot of talk or a lot of effects. The The thing is, I, 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 I feel and I think a lot of uh, the, the, the pre-production is, is without sound people. And that's a big problem. Did it make sense? Yes. So you just have to show up with all of your your whole bag of tricks and hope for the best. In in many cases, yes. And even for for some post production, I think it's the same. And they they come with a program and they said here it is, and you have one day to do it. But actually, it it requires two, three, four days because it's full of effects and whatever. But they say, oh, we haven't budgeted for that. So you need to. The production companies need to talk more to, to to the sound people if they want better sound in the end yeah earlier in the process yeah so do you have a specific production companies and directors that you work with because they know how to budget for this kind of no work no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> gotta pay the bills <laughs> you say yes to the work yeah <laughs> Yeah, just wondering if you over time, then you know, if you've had three bad experiences with a certain production company, then you just won't go back to them because they never no. have a focus on the sound. No, we are sound guys. We are sound people. We will fix it anyway. We will always strive to fix whatever is thrown at us. Good attitude. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, we have a question here from Biro Schneider. This is our foreman of the, of the board uh, for TV production today with short delivery times, especially for news. Do you have time for dubbing? Perhaps Barton or Lars could answer that question. We might be share that answer, Lars and I. <clears throat> well, normally for news, you don't uh, do dubbing. Uh, and for news, but in the news department, part of the news production, we also do uh, both short and long format documentary. That's a different case where we actually do the dubbing process. So, um, so it's a little bit both world basically. But for, for daily news production, this as a dubbing is not a part of the, the process. Yeah, it's, it's the same here because uh, the news, they just have to get it out as quickly as possible. So it's pretty much just turning the levels up or down. Uh, but once we go higher up, once we go to the documentaries, there are more time. And when we end up in the t uh, fictional department, there is yet more time. And I guess it, it kind of opens the discussion of uh, when or how is our tolerance to to bad audio quality and i'm not i'm not talking about 
bad audio quality as in you cannot listen to it but i guess there is a kind of a tolerance for for uh, for audio and the the audience have a tolerance when they're watching the news they don't expect all audio to be the the nicest uh, studio production but they do expect that once we have a tv series that uh, that 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 hits the screen uh, so so the amount of time it's also kind of getting into what what are the audience expecting here and then within those borders we have to deliver the best we can we can possibly do of course um but but there is we we don't have a, a one size fits all that's that's kind of one of our our issues uh and and what what do we want to deliver and uh, and also one of the issues that we face uh, within our organization is that we can do actually we can do only so much within here and then we kind of push it out there and most of the time we know where it's being received and we can kind of preemptive that but there is also a lot of times where we just can't control where where we're landing or uh, how the the systems we're landing on they uh, they they have a, a compression or they have some kind of codec that kind of disrupts our uh, our mixes from from within uh, especially when we do live shows uh, the the audio signal that we send out it will be uh, interpreted differently uh, according to the systems uh, they 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 hit in in the home in homes, but also in one of the different distribution channels that we uh, that we use. It's 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 not never a, a one size fits all, and no amount of time in uh, in post production can uh, can fix that at this point in time because th we just have too many deliveries, and uh, and maybe it would be <laughs> great if we kind of just made a decision that said well. We have this is the target, and we know that we can't be the best quality everywhere, but at least we can do it for the 90% of the time. But right now, we aim to do it at 100% of the time, which makes and a lot of, and especially the, the mid range projects, is uh, uh, we have the problems because because uh, that's when that we really see where the where the hills are, I think. Uh, and we don't have a solution for it right now, but it is something that we have focus on. And uh, of course, because we both deliver to to stream and we deliver to uh, to to uh, to flow. And uh, it's really again one size doesn't fit all. But I do think, and we are a lot of people trying to make decisions in here. But I always advocate for more time recording good audio because it not just because it's it's a it's a better working environment for the guys recording sound but also because it really saves us money we we just we know that when you come home with bad sound well then your time in post it just you need that time to fix the bad audio and you don't have the time to make it sound great and and that's really a cost that 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 shouldn't be there i think and uh and also our problem is that most of our productions we don't have a sound guy on set it's the photographer who is uh, recording the audio and uh, more than not he is more focused on delivering a nice picture than excellent audio quality so we have all those issues that we kind of try to get around and and well that's just our pains <laughs> but but i get it and everyone wants more time the photographer wants more time to to set up his camera the lighting guy wants more time to set up the lights and the audio guy wants more time and everybody wants more time but uh, at the end of the day it, it has to be some kind of compromise and we have to figure out where are we heading with this but but do... sorry go ahead yeah it's just a comment to both the, what you're saying last but also my other colleagues, um, and if Henry had been there, I would actually have brought up a discussion him and I had a, a past because he explained me how little of his time doing post-production was actually the creative part of it. And, and I was really surprised about that, that uh, dubbing is, is a lot about fixing, that the amount of time taken is used to fix technical issues related to the recording. Um, and not to be very creative. And, and that's interesting. It's, of course, a topic especially related to the way we do recording in television. Um, and as Lars mentioned, it's a photographer. It might even not be a photographer, but a, a VJ doing that program and doing the recording. And is this something that 
the rest of you can recognize that it's actually you're all talking about fixing stuff. And I'm thinking, wait, where did the creative part of it, this business went? Is not that a challenge? I think that's what uh, yeah we're hearing from a lot of people in the industry. And and maybe like I mentioned uh, before, uh, Christian is here from Soundflower. And uh, sorry, Soundflow. Um, Soundflower is another thing. I will send you a link. Um, not to take away from the, the discussion, but um, Christian's company Soundflow has uh, made a tool that is specifically for uh, improving efficiency and getting rid of this uh, repetitive, boring work so you can focus on the creative part. Um, so yeah, check that out. <laughs> it's already in use by some big uh, studios and production houses. But uh, Lars, my question to you, <laughs> aren't you the man in charge of these processes? So could you try to push to have a sound guy on you know, available on more of these on set, basically. I can try. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you making I, I that think, decision? Yeah. Of course, there's it's it. Everything has to deal with compromises, and as uh, I think everyone here is uh, well aware, then budgets are being cut all around, and uh, I think maybe it's just it's just too damn easy to cut on on sound flow. Because uh, it, 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 it's 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 at the end of the line. That's where you you kind of you see it, and uh, and it it's it's not it's 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 just not as uh, I think sound work probably just isn't uh, it, it's just not branded good enough. It's just not as sexy as uh, as the pictures we deliver, and uh, and it's very unfortunate actually. And uh, and I don't know why that that is happening, but. Um, I think also the the thing is that we are uh, we're raising our audiences to to kind of expect to be more visual visual and less auditive. Uh, of course, there's a lot of people who have sound bars, but not many people have the real Dolby setup, and not a lot of people are going to buy uh, the the Atmos uh, the systems right now because they're they're too expensive, and many many people they just watch television on their home screen with the with the speakers that are built in or they watch it on the phone maybe not even with with earbuds in uh just watching on an ipad and they're just getting used to poor audio quality and i think we as as uh, as creatives has uh, we 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 really need to to get out there and tell the story of of what shapes uh, a good television show what shapes a good documentary and, and audio is a big 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 part of it and also the thing about not being able to understand what is being said when there's dialogue or there's uh, interviews um i think we're getting worse and worse to being able to perceive uh, dialogue from just uh from movies and television because we're watching so much foreign uh, foreign stuff that is that are are texted that are subbed so we're getting more and more used to kind of reading what we're hearing so so the glaring point there is uh when we then when we see something in, in danish i think a, a lot of people and i hear a lot of people and a lot of our uh audiences they they turn on subs not because they really can't hear it but just they're not that used to it they're used to having both best of both worlds um, so I guess that it's also kind of the reality we're, we're talking into, I think. But but to answer your question, I I I try, <laughs> I try. But but really, there's not one person making all the decisions. We're always uh, trying to make, and you get some and you get some. But 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 really, I I really try to to kind of emphasize and tell them that. And also, as Morten is saying, the better sound we come home with, the more time we have to be creative and the less time we have to spend on, on quick fixes. And quick fixes in, in, in audio, is they are never really that good. They work, but it's, it's, it's not art or <laughs> it's, not, it's not that great. We, re we really shouldn't rely on them, I think. Yeah. And if you uh, do the sums, is it... I mean, it must be less expensive to have the sound guy go out with the 
<laughs> with the camera guy uh, in, instead of paying for this post-production afterwards. Yes, of course, yes. It's, 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 it's really a matter of cutting costs. And, uh, and also, well, to be fair, I think technology is also improving. So uh, having a setup where the same guy also does lights, does camera, does audio, it, it is becoming easier. But yeah. the problem is when it's becoming easier, then someone looks at it and says, wow, we can save money and not thinking about the final product. So that suddenly we're in this space where uh, the, the VJ tasks, where you have a VJ that's doing everything, that's fine for that kind of uh, job or that kind of production, but it doesn't fit everything. But when you just look at the numbers, it kind of sort of is, well, maybe we can make it work. Uh, and we really have to fight that, <laughs> I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and really because there are it's, of course there's situations where it's fine of yeah, course uh, it is and 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 then we should definitely go for it but but then but again it, it's really it's a story of one size doesn't fit all and especially when we're talking about uh, audio one size really doesn't fit all no and i guess it's hard to know uh, exactly how the sound, how challenging it's going to be before it happens, because you don't know what noise is going to be happening at the time, and yeah, it's hard to decide in advance exactly what you're going to need. Um, but uh, I think it was Martin who mentioned at one of our previous meetings that there's a real shortage of sound guys in the industry. I don't know if you meant in post production or production sound, but that's uh, another point that. <laughs> Yeah, there just simply aren't enough trained sound engineers uh, to deal with all of this content. Um, is that right, Martin? Or perhaps it was Eddie. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there should be still be sound guys out there available. Uh, but the thing is, I would like to, to, to ask Lars uh, whether he finds that the, the guys put out in the field doing the new stuff, picking up images and audio, how do you feel that the uh, education uh, is preparing them for that kind of job? Are they equally fitted for, for both uh, the image and for the, the sound? Or are they primarily uh, VJs with a, a big V for, for the visual thing? Uh, and uh, unfortunately, sound goes with it, and uh, you you they don't know much about it. How how do you feel? How is the the teaching that they receive before they enter your doorstep? Well, to be honest, there's not one answer to that. Okay. Because uh, people approach this uh, line of work from all kind of different. Uh, aspects and some are well they're just photographers and then they have to do the audio but some actually just think it's uh, it's great and it's uh, it's it's fantastic to do both i think if i have to be perfectly honest what i see is that the <laughs> younger generation the the ones that have uh, grown up with uh, everything is in one device they're more prone to be able to handle everything because they, they kind of think in a different way or they are, they're more open to, to, to dealing with the, these accessories that, uh, that are prone to happen. And they, they are not really that bound on what, am, what, what task am I doing here? Um, so, so most of them actually work very well doing a lot of stuff. And, uh, and then we, we have, uh, we see, not not from within our corporation, of course, but when we uh, buy something from uh, from others, uh, that when uh, when journalists uh, that are old school journalists, uh, they are handed a camera and and, and being told to do everything, uh, then it's uh, it's it's pretty much crap all around because they are not focusing on that. They are focusing on the story and the interview, and that really really shows. <laughs> I think that's a topic for a future future webinar. Uh, for, yeah, <laughs> recording good sign for all the podcasters and journalists. 
Yeah, but but, uh, but we are doing. We have we have some some in house uh, educational uh, programs uh, that that try to where we we kind of match up both uh, sound guys and uh, and photographers and journalists and and try to make them kind of uh, uh, exchange experiences and uh, and and it's 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 something that we we try to have uh, have focus on. But I think it it really all comes down to. What, what is the task at hand? And, and what I tried to say earlier about what, what are the tolerance for, for audio, that also speaks to what are the tolerance for the image quality? What are the, the tolerance for, for how the, the story is, is edited? And, and we, we really need to, to kind of have that understanding before we, we go into to the po po to a process. Uh, because uh, everyone, they kind of head on to the programs and they want to do the best thing ever. Uh, but but that not it's it's great to have great visions, but that doesn't necessarily turn out the the best of the of the the product that it could be. Because when when we have some of these uh, barriers, then we have to use them creative and find out how can we deliver within these boundaries instead of trying to kind of hit the ceiling every time. Um, and that's a bit boring to say, but. At least, if you say that you use it in a creative way, then it, it maybe it, it elevates us uh, somewhere. I don't think that's boring to say. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I'm just going to go back to the questions here for a moment. Uh, Anos, how often do you deliver an Atmos, and how do you see the future of immersive audio? Uh, I was just asking. Yeah, Martin Green. Yeah. about this before we started well i'm i'm right now i'm uh, doing a netflix original film uh in atmos it's the first thing i do in atmos we just installed the ceiling speakers uh two weeks ago just before we went to the mix uh and it's uh it's wonderful to work in atmos it's a netflix requirement that we work in atmos for netflix uh they, they do a, a lot of content in Atmos for home cinema. You don't have to have a room that is Dolby approved, but it has to be 7.1.4. Um, so I can uh, have a room that, because my room doesn't have the ceiling height to, be, uh, to get the Atmos approval, but it's a nice room anyhow. So um, uh, this is the first I do in Atmos. I guess if I'm doing more stuff for Netflix. It will probably be in Atmos. Atmos is uh, nice to work in. I have my computer set up just working with the Atmos renderer. Uh, I bought it. Now I have it. I use it. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a nice way to... It nice works. Way. It works. It's a nice way to get stuff uh, into 5.1 and in back down to stereo and so on. So why not just use it? Uh, whatever material way I have to deliver, if people are not working in Atmos, it's, um, they will of course get uh, 5.1 or stereo or whatever it's, uh, it is they want. Uh, one good thing about Netflix though, is that they used the, the uh, Atmos uh, dial norm for, uh, for uh, loudness measuring instead of looks, which, uh, which, um, which makes for a more um, dynamics in the mix generally, because then a loud, piece with loud music or loud effects won't affect how loud the dialogue level is for the whole show, which is good for, <laughs> for fiction. Uh, and I hope, uh, I hope at some point uh, we can be able to deliver in, in a dial norm or uh, in a way where, where, where the dialogue level is kind of uh, what, uh, what uh, dictates how loud the program is but we'll see about that but uh i have this show in atmos and there will probably be other shows in atmos because uh, uh it's as, as far as i know it's only if you work in uh, if you work in cinema and have to do a dcp that you have to pay the dolby um, fee which uh, is, is uh, could be uh, an issue it has been on a lot of the uh a lot of the feature films I've done over the years. That's uh, the one like when we stopped working with a film master in the end and worked for DCPs. Uh, uh, all the production companies were happy to not have to pay a Dolby fee in order to get a 5.1 mix to the cinema. 
And now, if you want to do an Atmos mix, uh, they all say, oh, Atmos, that's kind of expensive. Then I have to pay the, the fee and so on, and all these speakers, and you have to be, use a lot of time working to put all the sound into all these speakers. But um, now, with the, the tools, the way it works, integrated in Pro Tools and so on, I think it's just nice to have it ready at hand at all. So uh, hopefully we'll do a lot more Atmos. Yeah, seems to be the way. And if anyone out there wants to learn more about Atmos or uh, the audio definition model and next generation audio, we have two uh, webinars from last month where we had Dolby and Fraunhofer and BBC um, doing presentations and also three very cool um, sound designers and the, the following week. So that was a great discussion and uh, all of them are using Atmos. And yeah, but if you want to try working with immersive audio for free, you can um, use Fraunhofer's MPEG H and all of those tools are free and they also are compatible with Dolby Atmos files. So check it out. There's a lot of links and, and tools and stuff like that <clears throat> on our website under previous events. Um, let's just take another question. Oh, Lars Rasmussen says, I use SoundFlow and it's amazing and all facilities needed to make first aid on sound. So that's good to hear. Biro is asking about the situation for podcast production. But I'm not sure if any of you out there are working on podcasts. No, different, different crowd. <laughs> yeah, but I suppose um, dubbing for podcasts doesn't make, hopefully you're in a nice studio where it's quiet um, for most of, most podcast recording. Um, those are all the questions we have in the Q&A right now. Alan, you had a topic you wanted to speak about earlier. No, I had <clears throat> I had some remarks and now we're just going a bit back because Lars, he said something about branding of sound people, sound guys. And in, in the sound community, in the sound recordists community, we are very much aware that we need better branding and we need to educate producers and, and, and production people because we see almost all the time they have no clue of what we're doing and they have no clue of what the difficulties uh, we, uh, we experience. So, so we are talking <clears throat> regularly about how to educate and how to brand ourselves better. Uh, not, not us, but, but the, the importance of sound on set or in the news or whatever, how to, how to do it better. The thing is, <clears throat> Uh, most outside the sound department knows so little about sound. So if there's a guy with a boom uh, on set, everybody's happy and thinks, oh, well, he's good. And <laughs> probably never know if we get any sound. And usually, not usually, but sometimes productions get home with very crappy sound because they hired a very cheap sound guy who had a boom and everybody was was felt safe. And 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 we need to brand ourselves better in 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 terms of of what what we do and what we can do because everybody can do sound that is that is everybody can record sound but not everybody can anticipate the problems and how to fix them along the way uh, so everybody can put a mic on and and press record but what if and so on and so on and so on and that that what that's what make makes sound people good and and we have to brand that and we have to brand what what we add to the production in the end, because nobody knows. They just think, okay, we got sound, roll, whatever. Um, it's also so one, of, one of the biggest problems I think you, you face is that uh, it's, it's really, it's depressing, but when the sound guys are really, really doing a great job, then nobody notices. When they're doing a crappy job, then everybody hears it. I know that's not true for all of the time because there's also times where you, wow, that was a great sound or what a, you'd really notice it. But it, it really is when, when the photographer really makes a beauty shot, people are awed, but you don't necessarily have that same recognition when it comes to audio. 
Uh, that's that's Doing why a great I, job not making focus right. That's why that's why sound people are a little geeky and they have their own little party in the back because we we know when it was very good, uh, and and we are the only department not referring to the picture and that that says a lot when you're on set. Everybody works to whatever is in the frame. We do not. We do everything that's not in the frame actually, and and uh, I don't know what I want to say with that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, we have a couple more questions. I think one of the big issues is the people that make the budget and planning don't know what don't know what sign engineers are doing when we do mixes. Yes, I think everyone agrees on that. Isn't there um who is this person? Is is it the producer that is making the budget? You know, like when there's a large construction project and you have this education in Denmark called uh Bugnings constructor, Muskay. Yes. And they need to know a bit about this and this and this and this in order to make the project run smoothly. Um, who is that in the in this industry? Is that the producer? So the problem is we need to educate producers. It's uh it, it in in our in in DR it's uh it's kind of a mix of a lot of different people. Uh it's it's it depends on where uh, you're you're actually producing for because in 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 drama uh, in in fiction it's a, it's a producer and a post producer that's kind of trying to make things come together, uh, but when you're doing documentaries it's a production manager uh, often that has a kind of a this is the bag of money distribute it <laughs> and uh, in in news well we hardly ever do any post product processing in uh, in in sound so it's um, <laughs> sort of kind of irrelevant but there's then there's it's more the, the thing about the budget of what kind of equipment do we uh, acquire so it's it's not it's not in it and that's kind of the problem because there's not really one way or one target or one this is the guy or this is the person that you need to educate it's it's more complex than that yeah, but it for would be, us, I don't know um, how it works in in, the, in other industries, I guess. Or in a TV two, Martin. It's also spread out at TV two in in the in-house production, so that would be again a little boring. But yes, there is pro probably stuff that we can do to make. Uh, a better awareness and a better understanding of, of uh, what the audience should be as it uh, as surely. Um, <clears throat> so that's probably a topic that some around the industry should start thinking and trying to find out how to do that better. Yeah, like they should be a certified, go through a training program and receive whatever yeah, but it is. And some of this is also in my years, it's, it sounds like it's also about moving a little bit around with the budget. Because if we end up with shitty sounds and someone have to spend that time fixing it, it, it's just, but why didn't we hire that sound guy in the field or having better tools uh, when we did the recording? Um, and, and that kind of uh, understanding and uh, uh, aftermath calculation is probably not done very often and, and I think that's why we should we potentially as an industry could point out that this is where there are some stuff to be fixed uh, that there's some potential of, of doing stuff doing it better than we did in the past yeah and saving some money yeah or at least get a better audio because I think that's the most important because we're talking about it shouldn't be about audio as a saving money. No, but <laughs> it might make a more smooth process uh, if it's good from the, the start. And yeah, you're not left with an expensive ADR session or too much ADR at the end. Yeah. OK. We have a question from Kevin Dunn. Is there a risk that sound designers and engineers migrate from TV and film to the video games industry due to the perceived emphasis on the creative process? Uh, 
<laughs> yes, right up to the time that they uh, have children and they figure out they can't work 20 hours a day. <laughs> Which is required in the <clears throat> gaming industry. Nah, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. I would also say we're up to the point where they realize they, they can they can be in a studio with speakers instead of sitting uh, on a desk with uh, headphones on working. It's I don't know how it is in gaming industry. Uh, there are some people who have like who are like lead sound designers on A list games who uh, who have like lots of time to work on huge productions, which is great. They get a lot of creativity, but also they have to do to deliver a lot of content. There might be a lot of dialogue, and <laughs> that has to be recorded in a lot of different uh, variations. It has to be has to work as assets in a in a um, in a video game. I don't know anything about it. I have never worked with any. Uh, well, uh, twice in my twenty five years, I've worked with nonlinear content. Uh, so it's been. Um, so I don't think it's uh, it's a risk. It's it is what it is. I mean, if you if there's nice work with sound in a in a, the gaming industry, I think I, we should embrace it and say that people who work with gaming industry are brothers <laughs> and sisters, uh, and are working with the same kind of stuff that we're working with, and they have uh, probably have uh, similar uh, challenges as we have. I think you're right. And they also have some unique challenges in the way that the, the production itself has to function and, it, you know, with triggered events and looping and and all of that. We had an interesting talk from uh, Bjorn Jakobsen, uh, who has a company called Kujo Sound, um, and he's one of Denmark's best sound designers for games, I guess. And uh, he said he has to do 70... To eighty percent of the work before the game exists, <laughs> so he hasn't seen any pictures. He's just been given, a, yeah, some sketches or some, you know, had some discussions with people about the vibe of it, and and so for him, the challenge is um, like just imagining up an entire uh, Sonic universe before <laughs> seeing any pictures at all and uh, he often has those problems that Eddie was mentioning like uh, getting the wrong bird or uh, because he doesn't yeah and a lot of these uh, games are set in fantasy kind of environments so it's not like a <laughs> I suppose that's a positive it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to match a certain um, yeah landscape or something like that he has more freedom in that sense um but yeah i think with with gaming you have the full range from like small budget underground games to huge where they have a symphony orchestra recording uh recording the score for it so um, certainly um, yeah yeah but it's just saying also in post uh, working with fiction or documentaries for television or film or, or whatever the format will be or for uh, you have like very different budgets for very different kinds of production. I've worked on lots of television programs where you have like a day to do 30 minutes of, uh, of uh, finished <laughs> audio. You start in the morning by downloading the material and then you end the day by uploading it. And then uh, you, the day is spent mostly on technical stuff and you have like mm, so little room left for creativity. Which is what it is because that's the that's the challenge issue. I mean, they don't the, the people who hire you don't expect a lot of creativity. They expect you to work for intelligibility and work for it to sound good on a on the first pass, I guess. And uh, and then you get to have like a very small feature production. We have like a couple of days for a small episode, and then you you were expected to 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 be creative in some way and you will open up your library and you fetch a lot of sounds and be creative around them. And then you have the next level and so on and so on of, uh, of uh, productions. Once it's, once it's like funded by the Film Institute, you will probably have like a, a bigger uh, production time. And then you, you, will, you will have to, to uh, adjust, you have to uh, see how little time you can spend on a dialogue but you have to spend a lot of time on the dialogue because it's always the most important part. 
but you uh, you have to spend a lot of time on it because if you lose the story, if you lose the, the words, then you also lose all the fancy effects you put on afterwards because nobody hears them if they're annoyed with not uh, understanding the dialogue. And uh, and it's it just keeps on. You have to remember to 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 work at a as high a level of po possible of of um, of the intelligibility of the dialogue, and you have to work with like the music uh, that somebody else might create, and in order to get the feelings to be as uh, prominent as possible at the right spots, and then you have to weave in a lot of creativity for the rest of the part. But I think I think the if you uh, set your uh, ambitions according to the kind of production you're working with, you can you can be quite creative. But I mean, you're not super creative if you're working for like a day on the 30 minute program. It's there are limits to what you can do if you are like, for instance, working with like VJs on the field have to do a lot of noise reduction and so on. But but once it, it rises from that, there are, I mean, you can work with it and um, find the spots where you can be, where you can shine, <laughs> make, the, make the sound effects shine a little bit and uh, make it uh, get some fun with creative parts. That is certainly a challenge though. I mean, time constraints is the, it's definitely yeah. the enemy of creativity and <laughs> I, I suppose yeah you have to be a very talented engineer to just take those five minutes and do like um do something new each time you do a mix and a new creative process or something you have to be really determined not to get um bogged down with the, the pressure of and the mechanics of it just getting it done i can imagine um yeah but i suppose for alan on set recording, it's always fun. There's always a new challenge and a new uh, scenario. And <laughs> yeah, you're not getting bored of it yet. Nope. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Eddie, were there any other topics that we didn't, that we didn't? Uh... Oh, Alan, you have a few remarks. No, that was, that was before. Sorry. No worries. The thing is, I, I just want to say it's, it's so, so funny. <clears throat> I, I remember when when Pro Tools arrived in the Danish film school or whatever, and everybody was talking about how creative you could be now and how easy creativity it would be. And today I see 10% of the, the Pro Tools is used for creativity and the rest is for fixing problems. And that's a, that's a bit sad. Definitely. <laughs> and it's the same for musicians as well. Um, a lot of people trying to move away from the screen and have an analog setup. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder whether any of you have any kind of wish list for kind of equipment or software that you always wished for for, for your productions. Do you have any kind of thing that you thought, oh, if we just had that, then things would be easier. Um, then we didn't have to fix all the stuff. Then we could just could be creative instead. Do you think any any hardware software could help you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly some AI driven. Uh -huh features uh, i would say that a lot of the ai driven features that are coming these uh, years are interesting i mean the noise production that is ai uh, improved by ai like the dialogue isolation stuff it's uh, it, it's sometimes it's working wonders and other times it's just like being overused and every everything is just sounding like like a lot of artifacts all over the place but but it that somehow does give some room for creativity because then you can take a scene that's somehow not sounding as you wished it to be sounding and put get it to sound somewhere, somewhere differently and more in tune with what your uh, ideas of what 
you get you, you can free yourself of a lot of ambient noise that is uh, annoying and then you can kind of start up building up some interesting sounds uh, so i think uh, a lot of the noise reduction that has been introduced over the last decade i think has really helped a lot uh, but then again we're sound guys are not the only people who have noticed that you can do that so uh, so uh, that also has influenced the, the amount of time we have to work on it of course so it's um if you could just put it on put a dialogue uh, noise reduction plugin on your master dialogue chain then and then you're fixed uh, like 40% of your problems, then uh, then you might lose 40% of your time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you. And uh, I mean, it's uh, it is it is a challenge whenever there is something. And also, I would say about the the AI voices, uh, I I also looked into it. I haven't found any that uh, th th there are also problems because you have like actors who. Uh, I mean, if they don't get the pay for uh, doing ADR, that's kind of then they lose uh, lose out on that, and that's not so good. But it's uh, uh, if it works, if it doesn't take extra time for you to kind of work around that, and if you can make an agreement with the actor, it might work at some points. But uh, it's interesting; it could be something to fool around with and uh, see if it uh, can make stuff uh, grow somehow. But it's uh, it's interesting. It's an interesting thing. I don't expect we'll see any action movies with uh, <laughs> this kind of, of voicing, I guess. Are there any other features apart from noise reduction that currently use AI? Oh, that could could use AI. Yeah, also the the voice generation. But yeah, but not uh, like EQ or. Yeah. Uh, so, sometimes you you uh, you can have an EQ matching, which you may have the problem with, for instance, having a recording from different sites, and you want to match the 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 spectrum or the perceived spectrum of 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 any sound. So these uh, you, you can train your system to to get a kind of EQ match uh, from one scene to another in, in that way. And that's some of it is also based on artificial intelligence. And is that within Pro Tools or certain plugins? Yeah, it's a, a plug. It could be Isotope, for instance, that Isotope could be used yeah. for that. And Cedar Audio also has uh, that feature. Mm -hmm. OK, so it is happening. So it's yeah. happening. Yeah, absolutely. It's happening. Yeah. And there's also the re reverb matching tools. That's this software called Chameleon. I haven't used it yet, but it's it's able to listen to reverbs and uh, make a matching reverb. It should be sounding great. Uh, that's, that's... I don't know if it uses uh, AI or what, whatever, but it's uh, but uh, yeah, I haven't used it yet. So hopefully it will be. No, it's it's. I, I mean, if you need more reverberation, it works nicely. If you need less reverberation, you have a problem, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so, but if you need so to it's, match it's, in in one yeah. one way it goes, the other way not, yeah. <laughs> I should say. So there aren't any uh, de-reverberation. There is tools that you there, yeah. There, there is uh, also this time Isotope includes that and. Yeah. Uh, to some degree, it works, uh, but it really depends on what's going on in the background and other things, um, because um, strange things happen if it's too complex a, a, a recording you have to do it with. Mm -hmm. So I you see. may try it, and you may like it better than with than without. But it's not a thing that will work all the time, I should say. <laughs> I see. Not if, always to be trusted. Can I yeah. say something? Yes. If if I could wish for something AI like, it should be an automated boom wipe out program or microphone paint out program uh, that worked beautifully. Because a few years ago, David Fincher he made the the House of Cards, 
and and David Fincher, he hates the lavalier. So everything was on on the boom, and they painted the boom out, and that it, that season sounded so nice. So if you had a very very efficient and very good AI or a program that could paint out the boom and the microphones and stuff, then we could do sound that sounded two thousand times better. And we talk about it when, when we make feature films, we talk about when if they use two cameras, one is one is wide and one is tight, and they will always end up using the tight shot, but the boom will be in 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 the in the other uh, out of the other frame, and it's it's so damn annoying, but you could just paint it out if it was cheap enough. So we talk about it regularly. How cheap is it now? Can I can I go in the large frame and you can paint it out? And it's mm -hmm. it's still nothing that's taken very seriously, but a program that could do that would be awesome. So the invisible boom mic, that's your wish. Your hot no. wish for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> but is there something you can do to the boom mic that will make it easier to, to remove from the picture? I think you I think you can paint it green or something. I don't know. Yeah. Well, let's just do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Solved. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Lars Rasmussen says uh, a software that can scan a waveform in a folder so it's more easy to find alternative dialogue to replace and fix the audio. That's a good one. <laughs> Thumbs up from Martin. <laughs> uh, we have actually just about run out of time for today. Um, does anyone else have any final comments? before we wrap it up. That's a no. <laughs> Not from Martin. Well, thank you for being here from your cars and from your studios and uh, for answering everybody's questions. Um, we're going to share, send out an email tomorrow with the uh, recording and some links and things like that. Um, and you're always welcome to get in touch if you would like to, to contact any of our panelists. Um, or if you want to hire them for the, for your next film. Uh, yes, we can do that. And yeah, keep an eye out on our website for the upcoming events. And yeah, I think that's everything from us for today. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for joining us, everyone in the panel and everyone out there. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.